All right, so <coughs> it's Friday, August 3rd, 2018. This is Layla Boral interviewing Melissa Squires in the Public Library in Middle Village in Queens for the Stonewall Oral History Project. Thank you. I really appreciate your taking the time. It's nice to be here today. That's great. So can you tell me where and when you were born and something about how you grew up? Um, so, well, we should start at the beginning. I was born in Manhattan, and, um, and when my family was small, uh, it was me and my brother, and when my mother got pregnant for a third time, the two-bedroom apartment in Peter Cooper Village was no longer um, big enough for the family, and so we moved out to Long Island. Uh, I have no memories. I've seen pictures of, of life off First Avenue in, in the mid-20s. In fact, two years ago, uh, I was there uh, walking a friend home in Stuyvesant Town, and I passed the building where I lived as a little baby, probably a building I have not seen in very many years. Uh, so I grew up on Long Island. Uh, Long Island in these days, these would be the early 1950s, was transitioning from farmland to a residential beehive of returning veterans and their families, the famous baby boom. We were part of that. My dad served in the Pacific. Uh, my mother and father married in 1948 in Brooklyn, where they grew up, moved into Manhattan. Um, my father worked in the garment district, as most Jews did in those days. Uh, and then uh, we moved out to Long Island. There were still remnants of potato fields. There was still that rural past when we were there. Um, I'm, we moved there about 1953. And to, I can remember playing in the potato fields and scarecrows and the, that, of course, that part of Long Island, of Nassau County, is long, long since disappeared. And, um, but it, it's a cool part of my past. And we grew up in a sea of kids just like us. There were thousands and thousands of young families, children of veterans, who all left the big teeming city and moved to Long Island. And, um, you know, for a while it felt like being an ant in an anthill. And on my block, if there were 30 houses, 25 had a mom and a dad, two, three, four, or five kids, uh, and it was a circus. And, um, and we, everyone hung together and everyone played together, and it was a, a way of life that apparently has disappeared. Do you remember yourself as a little kid? You know, as, as a little kid, I, I fit in. You know, I fit in. Uh, as a very young kid, I fit in. I was the oldest of three. Uh, I have a younger brother and a younger sister. Um, you know, my family was a little eccentric. Uh, it, it, you know, but there were, there were emotional issues with my parents, and it permeated down to us as kids. You know, there was something a little bit missing. And I started to have cognizance and awareness of gender at a very, very young age that seemed to be different. And... Uh, I used to have fantasies about me being a girl. I, and I looked around and got a sense of gender identity in the world around me. And, and I became a, a little four-year-old social scientist taking mental notes uh, because some of it made sense and some of it didn't. And I was able to see gender identity differences. We're talking the 1950s. Uh, and some of it I identified with and some of it I did not. And I would say I did not begin acting out on these fantasies till I was probably seven or eight. Um, you know, there's this whole thing about boys playing with 
boys and girls playing with girls, or again in those days, I had none of that. I had little boyfriends, I had little girlfriends. The, uh, there were no differences between uh, the sexes in terms of who I was supposed to spend time with. And, and we did little playful things, switch clothing and things like that. And, uh, and, you know, to me, this was part of my childhood. Of course, as I got older and my awareness of the world around me increased, I began to realize that there were rules uh, as to what to do and what not to do. Getting caught with mommy's makeup was bad. Uh, the, the horror of finding out that nail polish doesn't come off with soap and water was a serious problem. I can remember once uh, having to file the tops of my nails because I didn't know how to get rid of the nail polish. Um, experimenting with, with my mother and sister's clothing and, you know, looking and acting like a little boy and just starting to feel disconnected, disassociated and having no outlet, no language, no role models. All I had was me in the anthill and my feelings. I discovered probably by the age of eight or nine, you know, as I was in my mind very subtle and discreet that my little boyfriends did not have the same kind of conflicted feelings that I did. And I discovered that I was uh, rather unique in this. I was not effeminate. I was never really bullied. Other, I can, was bullied at one point just because being a little kid with older kids, but I don't think that's so unique. And so I, I fit in with the little boys, you know. Um, it came naturally to me on the outside, and, um, but on the inside that there was a conflict. And how do you remember your parents? Sort of how they related to you and you to them in those early years. Um, what happened when I, when as I approached puberty, my father worked in the city. Eventually, it was determined that um, being a a, a bedspread and textile salesman uh, was not his dream, and he wanted to be a teacher. And so he went back to school and got a master's degree. I saw very little of him when I was a young child. He was. We lived on Long Island, and he was in the city, and so he would leave very early and get home, you know, for an eight-year-old. We were we we followed a ritual, you know, you know. Our mom kept control on three kids, you know. The three of us had a two and a half year separation, and so in order to keep sense in the household it was very strictly regulated and we would go to bed all thrown in bed there was nothing worse than going to bed in the summertime when it was still light out for example and um, my mother has an obsessive uh, nature when it comes to detail especially her things and she became aware very very early on that something was amiss with her clothing and uh, so I was a world-class liar. I was a pro at it. I was such a good liar that I believed my own lies. And um, I don't know whether really my mother ever did. You know, she was uh, um, she, she not the most trusting of people. And so I would be accused. I would deny it. I blame others, you know. I, had I been a child today, I probably would have blamed uh, aliens. You know, um, but I was experimenting. I was not really getting away with it. I can remember when I was 11 that um, in those days, uh, this is years before Stonewall, that there were rules against um, behavior that transgressed gender identity. And I can tell you, it was 1962, and, and in my house, we got the New York Times delivered in the morning and Newsday in the afternoon. And in the metro section, in those days, the New York Times had a whole section devoted to New York City. Hard to believe, right? And, uh, and one of the stories on the front page of the metro section uh, was a man 
arrested for dressing in women's clothing. And not only did this story make the front page of the Metro section, they described in detail what he was wearing from head to toe. And I was astonished. I was absolutely gobsmacked. What is this? What does it mean? And so I asked that question that, that, that every mother of an 11-year-old wants to hear in 1962, Mommy, what's a transvestite? And, um, and I got uh, probably a reasonable answer, and my, head, my little head exploded. And I dedicated the next four years to finding out everything I could about this thing, this manifestation. When there would be school holidays, I would go to the library where I lived. If I tell you I read every book in the library that had anything remotely due to this manifestation, this thing, I would not be exaggerating. I would leave the house at 10 in the morning and stay in the library till it closed. I would read fiction, nonfiction, detective stories, psychological, anything I could get my hands on to find out more about the history books, anything. Um, and I got to discover there was something called homosexual, and I got to discover that there was this other thing that was considered part of it called, in those days, there was transvestites and transsexuals. And uh, I was obsessed, and so in my outer life, I, I, was, I was a good little boy athlete, and in my inner life, I was obsessed about this thing that my next door neighbor had a book called Psychologica Sexualis, she, uh, something like that, from the 19th century Hirschfeld. And, and I discovered it. Uh, the kid next door was close to my age. And I found out gobs and gobs of 19th century case histories of this. And if, if I could have stolen this 15-pound book of 2,000 pages and hid it under my bed, I would have done it. Um, I, got, I got caught playing with makeup in, in my house, in my next door neighbor, and my friends down the house. It was, you know, my secret life was beginning to spill over. Um, I've been very good at compartmentalizing my feelings. It's taken uh, years of, of loss, hardship, heartache, and therapy to overcome that. I'm still pretty good at doing it. Um, but I became really agitated. As I approached puberty, you know, I was at a loss. You know, I can think back to all the books, plays, movies I've seen about the coming of age story, how wonderful, exciting, you know, a million. I have no memories of any of that other than terror, confusion, fear. Um, I remember so little of my junior high school years, which where I grew up was 13 to 15. I remember virtually nothing. I was a, a little boy one day and a wildly confused teenager the next. It was as if I was abducted by aliens. Um, and I learned to just hide my feelings, you know. Um, I was going to focus on my outer side. Uh, my, sexual, my sexuality completely uh, was unmanifested. All the things that little boys instantly, organically knew, no, I knew none of it, zero. Um, I mean, I didn't loo lose my virginity to college. I, even the idea of, of masturbation was a shock and well, well into my high school years. Um, none of it came naturally. And um, so I just manifested myself and, and was this, this person on the outside and uh, struggled and suffered on the inside. Uh, I, was a, I became a jock, you know, a sensitive jock. I probably do have those today. Um, 
I wasn't mean or rude. You know, I was kind. I was friendly. I was, you know, I, I yearned companionship of people. Um, but I had this, this secret part of me that I just, you know, kept hidden. And I was not feminine or feminine. I don't know if my little friends guessed or knew or suspected. When I was little, we didn't have gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. You, you had tomboys and sissies. There was real, and I don't really know if there was a sexual orientation connected to tomboys and sissies. They were just tomboys and sissies. I was neither. You know, I, um, I was neither. And um, I, was, I ended up being a varsity athlete. I did reasonably well in school. My life started to fall apart um, uh, with uh, first uh, alcohol and cigarettes and then um, in the late 1960s, um, smoking pot. And this is not unique or special. Um, what makes my story unique and special is to continue with the smoking and the drinking and the drugs until I ended up homeless and, uh, and well, well, well past the age when people should know better. Um, and so that's it. I got out of high school. Um, I my relationships were all chaste. Uh, I didn't get them. I, I dated girls. I felt nothing. Um, I did it because that's what the other kids did. You know, I would, I would look at the boys, I would look at the girls, and I would see their behavior and, you know, and make all my little mental notes, the little social scientists, you know, and just figure out what boys do and what girls do. And, um, and I went away to college and uh, I failed spectacularly. I was someone that was uh, bright and clever, and, um, and I was unable to overcome my inability, really, to, to manifest myself, uh, that to go from a, a little kid to a, a teenager to a young adult. You know, I failed, and my world around me sort of collapsed. Thank you. So, so what happened when, when college didn't work out? What happened next? I, I would have to think, you would think I would know this by heart. I think I went to four or five colleges. I flunked out of my second college. The first college was wildly expensive. I, I, Mostly, I just majored in drugs. Um, my third college, I, I was able to get in by starting at night school and then going to day school. So I graduated. I, I probably was 24. Uh, I tried going to graduate school. You know, I was dating and um, and as I, uh, in my early 20s, mostly I was known for prodigious drinking, um, massive amount, drugs in those days was pot. I mean, you know, it was really all that was available. And, um, and my dating life, you know, women liked me. I was distracted. Um, I liked them as people without really being emotionally engaged. And, um, and I would say probably by the time of 25, yikes, how, my obsession with gender identity found an outlet and I probably went out cross-dressed for the first time. I was, I graduated with a degree from Buffalo no one hated weekends more than me because on weekends all the guys and gals knew what to do in weekends and I was at a complete loss. They would all go and looking for um, a, a significant other and, and I would just, you know, drink and do drugs and sit in my room. And probably mid-twenties I was able to go out cross-dress. I think back of my appearance in those days and, um, you know, 
what does a varsity athlete do dressed as a woman in public for the first time? Well, that's sort of what I look like. And, uh, and I found that there were hidden secret groups of people doing exactly like this. Again, this is 20 years before computers, and, uh, and I found it. And I, in, I was graduate school in Albany, and there was a group there, and I went there, and uh, again, for the second time in my life, my little head exploded. And I met people that were, in those days, the range of gender identity. See, in, in, you know, now we have a hundred different gender identities. You know, in those days, you had four. You had male, female, you had cross-dressers, and you had transsexuals. And, and transsexuals were either on their way of getting uh, gender reassignment or after it. And that, and that was really it. And, um, and, so, and so I plopped myself down in the middle of this scene in Albany and um, with my exploded little head and looked ridiculous and felt awesome and was able to communicate and share a space with people that, that were going through this experience. When are we talking? We're talking 1975, you know, 76 maybe. Um, Do you remember how you found the group in, in Albany? When I have to think back on, on how I discovered this, uh, I don't, I cannot remember it. You know, it, it was all done post office boxes and It might have something to do. I don't. You know, later, once this, I, I, I know what happened after it. I, I must, it might have had something to do with the library. It might have had something to do with alternate newspapers. I don't know. I don't know. I, I met a gay couple when I was in Albany, the only gay couple I knew. But this, they were men, and they were men in love with each other, and so this was certainly not part of their realm. I don't know. I cannot remember it. I can remember that once I had this, um, I left graduate school and came back to New York and, um, and became more open to this idea that I was different from uh, my friends. Do you remember what it took the first time that you cross-dressed and went out? Like what it took for you to, to build up your nerve to do it? Oh, you know, it, the cliches and stereotype of doing this in the 1970s now exist only in, in the midst of history. You know, the fear, the, the terror. Again, it was against the law for men to dress in women's clothing in New York City, um, which is why people would have these secret meetings outside. And, and this was after Stonewall, and now new behavior was becoming accepted. You know, I was so terrified and so excited, the combination of both. Um, and my excitement overcame my terror. Uh, you know, I mostly, it was, you know, I, to go from my apartment to the car, to the place, back to the car, back to the apartment. So in, in terms of actually being outside was pretty limited, but it was very cool. And, um, you know, I just, the excitement was overwhelming. And, um, and I didn't know what it meant. You know, in, in this group of people, I can think back. I would say there were 20, 25 people. The, the, the person who ran this group was married and, uh, and their wife was. Sorry. That's the books. <laughs> Someone returning their books. Mm. <laughs> um, She was very understanding. She helped with my makeup. I looked 
Did I look like a clown? Maybe. Did I feel like? No. And there were people there that looked, that looked very strange. A lot of books are being returned right now. <laughs> a whole shelf worth. I'm sorry, so you were saying what people looked like. The range in people that looked, they looked from very eccentric to very strange to desperately wanting to fit in in this gender identity. I was able to find there a group of young gay people that looked way better, that manifested way more realistic, and I hung to them because you know, as opposed to the, the 50 and 60 year old World War II veterans, not so much. But a 22 year old fashion buyer from New York City looking amazing, it's like, this is someone I want to know. And so that's who I, I was in my mid 20s and this is something. And I wanted to figure out how could I get from me to her and um, and that became my obsession. And I left Albany, I came back to New York. <clears throat> I mean, everyone I knew in these days, you know, they were, they were all getting married. It's like, where do old single people do? And it's like, I should go back to New York. I was all of 25 at the time. And um, I was, uh, I couldn't find work and I was starving to death but I couldn't leave Albany because I was playing Albany City softball and I was hitting really well. And I'm in, when I'm in that, that, you know, zone, you know, I didn't want to upset it. I, there, there were people from all over the city and I was smacking the ball. However, uh, I was radically losing weight because I couldn't feed myself. And so I came back to New York and a, um, High school friend of mine uh, found a place in Queens, and I was able to find work. And um, and there was a group of people. And now it, it's the mid '70s, and disco revolution is exploding. And so I I've gone from being a, a jock to a hippie to a freak to a hipster to a sophisticate. All these different identities to try to hide how I felt about me in, a, in this world. And, um, and I found gay people, and, um, and I started hanging around with gay people. And I had a friend um, uh, who I slept with. Uh, a, a, uh, he worked with a friend of mine from high school, and, uh, and he and I got together. And so we made a deal. He was from Brooklyn, and I was in Queens. And we made a deal. There was a, a club that he wanted to go to, um, in, in Manhattan uh, called the Mine Shaft, and I would go with him to that. And there was a club that I wanted to go to in Times Square called the Gilded Grape, and he would go with me to that. And so this would have been the end of 1976, and mid-20s, and uh, we went to the Mine Shaft, and pitch black, naked men, packed together, like sardines, loud music, craziness going on. He loved it. I'm looking at my watch going, this is not what I am interested in. And then two weeks later, we went to the Gilded Grape. And Gilded Grape was the, the scene for transgender New York. And I went to Gilded Grape in December 1976, and in some ways, I never left. And um, Eventually, he and I drifted apart. He went to being, uh, being a gay man, and I went to this place uh, and this scene to explore a world of a completely different gender identity. And um, I was not one of the girls, you know. I, they were beautiful and feminine, and most of them were uh, Latina and African American uh, with a smattering of white people. and. It was a different world that was completely foreign to me, and I learned to navigate. 
mostly the way I learned to navigate uh, was with uh, drugs and alcohol. You know, that was my role, and um, and that's how I made friends. And um, uh, and with within three years, my desperate effort to fit in. Uh, became a serious problem uh, that my drug addiction really took over. What was it like hanging out in trans New York in the 1970s? You know, for me, you know, now with my 21st century sensibility, for me it was great. I had white privilege. I had a college degree. I was able to interact between both worlds. I had no consequences. Um, the people I knew, my friends, had none of that. You know, trans people really didn't go out during the day. Trans people had no access to resources other than sex work. Trans people had uh, very, very difficult living situations where you get a two-bedroom apartment and six girls would live in it. In, in apartments that were so disgusting, so horrible. That part of Times Square has all been eliminated and been replaced by uh, um, all those beautiful, beautiful uh, co-ops and condos on 8th and 9th and 10th Avenue. Back in, in, in the 70s, it was rat-infested, horrible, disgusting. For me, it was great. You know, I was a tourist. I loved going. I was there as much as I could. Um, I had a car in those days, right? I still lived in Queens. You know, how many times did I, I after I would wake up on Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when my car had long been towed, where? You know, it was a mess. I was a mess. I was never happier. I was, it was an amazing world. It was lights. It was action. It was music. It was amazing people. It was, I made lots of friends. How real were those friendships? I have no idea. Would I, was any of it based on me and not the drugs? I have no idea. It opened up a world that I never knew existed. So I had a double life, you know. I had my, my white person daytime life and then I had this nightlife you know, where I would tolerate being with my straight friends until about midnight or so. I had this whole ritual of going, going to the bars and, um, um, and eventually the hanging out with my straight friends, you know, my work friends, my school friends, that all disappeared. Um, within three years, really, of this, of exploring, of finding this place, everything was gone. You know, I had, I had lost everything and um, and I was in serious trouble and I didn't know what to do and um, and so what I ended up doing is I was lucky I uh, in those days the newspaper had help wanted ads and I found a, a job uh, for an accountant in New York City I was struggling at work um, I was my brightness and cleverness was not helping um, what really was hurting me was my, uh, my drinking and drugging. And so simple tasks became impossible. And people would yell at me all the time for making stupid mistakes, which made me angry. So it was a, a spiral. And so I was able to find a help wanted. I applied for a job. And they didn't want me. They didn't feel it was appropriate. But they said, we have this other job. And I interviewed for that. And uh, after I interviewed, um, I found myself on the way to the Middle East where I lived for the next three years. And so I, I took a job in a construction, overseas construction project, building an air base in Israel for the next three years. And um, I tried living in the big city without cocaine, big city, Tel Aviv, and um, it was torture. And I couldn't do it, and so I was the only person to volunteer to move to the desert and live at the job site in the desert. Everyone else had to <clears throat> be forced to move there. One person even sued the project. Me, I volunteered, and I lived in the desert for two and a half years. And back to my little compartmentalized life, 
and um, where I got to be a happy alcoholic, working with lots of other happy alcoholics, where the job, who uproots everything to live in the middle of the desert for years with a contract, but alcoholics that would love nothing more than, than to drink all night, pass out at their desk during the day, send home to, to the, the little lady and the children back in Alabama, Massachusetts, North Carolina. Um, you could, uh, we would see Americans that would be passed out in their truck and the 2,000 Thai men doing all this backbreaking labor in the middle of the desert. And, um, um, and so that was it, you know, this was great. I paid off my prodigious drug debts and, um, and I stayed there and, um, oh, I don't know, 10% of the workforce was American, 5% was British, all the rest were, were men from Thailand. And, um, and, you know, it's, and I hit out, I hit out. I turned 30 in the middle of the Negev desert, you know, passed out on my, my little hut um, after a night of drinking, worked 11 hours a day, six days a week. Um, and, and pretended that you were a man like every other straight man there? Well, the, the, there was a smattering of women and they knew that, that, that I was safe. And that, <clears throat> that didn't upset me. I heard it enough that, you know, there would, the women would all get together and I would find myself with them. I also played ball. Um, I was a wonderful softball player. Um, I ended up on the, in the league. They, they wanted us to be happy. They built things for recreation. Um, I was in the softball league. I ended up on the air base all-star team and in the Jewish Olympics called Maccabi Ah Games, they wanted me to play for Israel in softball, but I couldn't, I couldn't get up to Tel Aviv on Sundays because I worked, so I could not. But I, I was flattered to be asked, and, um, and they wanted me. So, I, you know, mostly I, I worked, I played ball, I drank. And what was your relationship like with your parents and your siblings? Out of sight, out of mind. Um, I, God, you know, I, at one point I, I came home. After a year and a half, I came back to New York for three weeks. I borrowed my parents' car and I crashed into a brick wall and totaled it and woke up the next day in a neck brace in the hospital in Manhattan. And I realized, you know, again, three o'clock on a Sunday, I said, oh my God, did you call my parents? And they go, your parents, you're 30 years old. Um, that was a terrible, terrible weekend, I gotta tell you. Uh, my sister moved to California, my brother new moved to New Mexico. You know, my siblings and me, you know, we all left. L-E-F-T, you know, um, and so we left, and we went far away, and uh, I communicated with my mother and father, um, you know, it was, if they were an essential part of my life, I don't remember, <laughs> I just don't remember. Stonewall like riots. The riots, did you know? I, about I was on Long Island. Uh, Stonewall happened a week after I graduated high school. Um, did it resonate with me? No. No. Um, if you ask me what happened during the summer of 1969, I could tell you that um, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I can tell you that Woodstock happened. I can tell you that me and two friends got a Volkswagen and drove to California. Uh, one of the great, great 1960s cliches, but for three kids from the suburbs, 
It was fucking awesome uh, to discover America through, you know, and all the back roads in a Volkswagen bus. And um, that's what my summer of 1969 was. Whether it, it had to do with the gay revolution, no, didn't really. In fact, we got to California and um, the weekend we got there were the Manson murders. And it's like, we have alibis, so don't, you know, the, the, the new people, it's like, it wasn't us. So um, L.A. was all about the Manson murder. So no, I uh, guess, you know, you know, what did I know? I knew very little. You know, what was, how, what was life like in a world with, with newspapers, with five television networks, uh, stations with radio, with <laughs> colleges that where people would come all over the world and and meet each other for the first time, where where there were regional differences in America. You know, there there were differences. You could tell who grew up in Nassau County and who grew up in Queens. The differences were enormous. Who is from Manhattan? And who is from Brooklyn? Enormous. If you take a look at Saturday Night Fever, enormous differences. Now, of course, there are no differences. You could, you could be from Brooklyn or Kamchatka in Russia and probably like the same music, the same language, the same books and, and cu cultural references. I mean, in those days, it was just, you know, completely different. I um I am the best student of human behavior. You know, I wasn't really involved. You know, I I watched everyone else and acted accordingly. I it was the only way I could navigate. You know, I made friends, but not really because, you know, I was fake. I was a fake person. And I was able to manifest during the day, and at night I just drank. I didn't know how to mesh the two together. So can you tell me, can you kind of tell me the story of how you put yourself together and how, how you got to be more in a place Oh where my you? God. So, let's see. I came back from overseas. Most of my friends continued on. I had friends that I met on that job that never came back to the United States that worked overseas the rest of their lives, uh, that made astounding money, found love and life, built lives as expatriates and never came back. Um, I came back, my, my life was a chaos insanity of three years, all the th thousands and thousands of $1982 were all gone. Um, I went back to the nightclubs, my clubs, the, the trans clubs. I met people. I did massive amount of drugs. And then finally, I, I learned that, that all this wasted time and money snorting cocaine, I learned how to smoke it. And um, within two, two and a half years, my life had disappeared completely. And then eventually I, I, I lost my home. I lived in Brooklyn Heights for a year and I was so outraged at paying $400 a month for a studio apartment on Henry Street in Brooklyn Heights, a block from the promenade. How dare you charge so much money? How dare you? So I moved to Woodside um, a block from the seven train and a one bedroom for uh, 220 a month um, with the, the train would come rattling past and um, and eventually the 220 a month was far more than I could afford to pay. I eventually fell behind oh about six months and was evicted and uh, and I went to rehab. And when I went to rehab in my late 30s, all my money gone, no friends. My family was frightened by me. At one point, they thought I was suicidal. And my house of cards collapsed. And I said, I can't. 
I no longer have the ability to do this anymore. And, um, and I talked about it in rehab, and they said, oh, we have no idea what you're talking about. We are absolutely clueless. Gay. And I went straight, and I went, and they said, well, they have a gay center in Manhattan on West 13th Street. You should go there after rehab, and I did. And, um, um, and I discovered they had something there called the Gender Identity Project. And, and I went. And I was afraid to go, and I was afraid not to go. And it wasn't in a bar, three o'clock in the morning, and it wasn't in, the, in the, the small town in upstate New York hopping from an apartment to a car. You know, it was real life. And I went. And I discovered that the Gender Identity Project were people that were exactly like me. And I couldn't believe it. The tree fell. Timber! <laughs> It's called the internet. <laughs> Jeff Bezos, a hundred billion dollars. It's easy. Internet. <laughs> Sorry. You need a break or anything? You want some water? No. You no. Okay, so you're at the at the center and you discover that. And um so at this point. I, I desperately tried to learn how to be clean and sober. I sucked at it. I tried. And I discovered that my fear of my gender identity was going to kill me. That if I could not embrace this journey, I would die. That I had come to the end you know, it was, the, I had nowhere else to go but go forward and to walk into that fear. And, and I moved literally around the corner from the center on West 14th Street. And um, my job uh, that I had at the time go, wow, you were really awful when you were drinking and doing drugs, but now that you're not, now you're worse, so you're fired. And uh, so what happened is I, uh, Well, I was so wildly distracted at this point. Again, without the, the fake house of cards, you know, I, I, I'm old enough to remember smoking indoors, um, and I used to smoke in, if I would work eight hours a day, I would close to probably smoke 15, 16 cigarettes a day in my office. So I used to have a big ashtray. So I was on the phone trying to talk to sober people, a cloud of smoke in this office, and I was distracted, and, and they said, you know, what, and they were afraid I would sue them, so they gave me a reasonable amount of money, which helped. Uh, I went to Gender Identity Project. I started to examine my life as a trans person, as a trans woman. It took about three months. Um, my parents were horrified. I was really nervous. To my face, everyone said, you're amazing, you're doing great. Behind my back, they said, never in a million years is this going to work. Well, I, you know, I was a guy, and, and so. Um, and, you know, so at first, I was Melissa in my apartment, and I was Melissa at the support group, and then we would go out and get a snack, and then I would visit friends. And then, you know, after six months, I went on the subway and, and would go out during the day and would start 
you know, all those different manifestations of becoming trans, becoming a trans woman, and electrolysis, and then hormones. And, and each day my Melissa life got bigger and bigger. And, um, and after, a while, I went to visit my uncle. I went, we'd go there every Christmas, and I went to Christmas that year as must, must have been around, I've been on hormones for a little bit less than a year, and I went as boy Melissa, and I saw the picture of me, and it's like, oh, you can't go out looking like this anymore. You look really weird, you know, um, because I was both genders in one body, and it just like, oh my God, I, I was just, you know, I mean, without, so I knew that that my guy life was over. I, that, that I had transitioned and it, it was obvious to see it in that picture. And I started, um, friends of friends would find assignments, find gigs, I would get opportunities. I mean, I, I didn't have a full-time permanent job for years. You know, finding work as an out trans person in the early 1990s was not easy. I was too old for sex work. Um, the idea, I, I, I had friends at Show World, um, you know, that was not going to be my journey. Um, through friends, you know, I found gigs, I found things that would pay money. I, I was an office manager, I, I did telephone sales, I did, I became a cocktail waitress at a bar around the corner from me. You know, being cocktail waitress was awesome. It saved my apartment. I was taken to housing court again as I became Melissa because I couldn't find work. And then I think what happened, I got high. Oh, we, I became an activist. So there was a political component to the Gender Identity Project. Loud people that said, this is a political movement. And I said, you people are crazy. You know, I want to become a woman and, and white picket fence and woodwork and disappear. I don't want to be trans anything. I, that's, and they said, you're wrong. And I said, you're crazy. And two years later, I realized that they were right. And so I became a fringe member. I was not a leader. You know, we're talking almost 25 years ago. And but at one point they had the gay games in New York City, and it was 1994, and they said the rules for transgender people to compete in gay games are more strict than the Olympics. That is bullshit. And we had a meeting with the board of directors at gay games, the trans community as it was at the time. And I was very much one of those sitting in the back, oh yeah, me too, yeah. And the board of directors at gay games, um, uh, took a look at uh, at the rules and they said, you know what, you're right, and we're wrong, and um, and and we're going to have to change this, and and all of us were were ecstatic, and a transgender group has won a victory for trans inclusion, and the leader of our group um, stood there with her arms folded, and goes, if you were really trans inclusive, you would hire a trans person and. And they huddled among themselves. And um, the leader on the board of directors that we dealt with was a journalist named Ann Northrop, who I remain friends with to this day. She was amazing. She was a visionary. She saw the future. She quit her straight job and became an activist for LGBT people, a great leader in ACT UP, a great leader today. Uh, I always embarrass her with praise. Um, she's a great, great journalist, and I owe her a great deal. And um, and she told us, well, we'd hire, no trans person has applied. And so they called me. Gay Games was looking for a trans person. So I applied, and, and they hired me. And I got to go to work at a full-time job every day my first job, and uh, of course it was a temporary job, and eventually I was fired, because the gay games ended. Um, I did great at gay games. You know, to 
socialized in the workplace as a trans female um, in 1994. It's an out trans woman, uh, was pretty cool. Um, you know, I tried to get jobs that it, go to employment agencies, and they thought, it's like, wait a minute, did such and such send you here? You know, are you kidding? We don't have anything for you. Why don't you come back next week, okay? And then after a while, I realized they were just mocking me, and I, I would stop going. And um. Uh, and a friend of a friend hired me as a um, a debt collector, and so a part-time debt collector, and uh, and I got really good. I got really good at being a debt collector, and I got really good at living on a tiny, tiny, tiny little salary in my tiny, tiny, tiny little 14th Street apartment. And m my friends would get, to, and I knew would go out with them, and I would know the cheapest thing in every single menu and every used to have something in the Greenwich Village called coffee shops. They're all gone now, but uh, there used to be a lot. You know, you know, no one would get that onion omelet and a Diet Coke, you know, three and a half dollars, and it's perfect. And, um, and my friends would yell at me, and it's like, you know, stop getting comfortable being poor. You know, you're afraid. Stop being afraid. Go out and look for more. And, um, I got hired by Gay Men's Health Crisis. I, I got hired as a receptionist to pay 22000 a year. And I went, 1996, I went home and cried. I hadn't had a full-time permanent job in five years. Health insurance, benefits. Five years since I had had a full-time permanent job with benefits. Um, I lasted a year and a half. Eventually, my job was excessed. It, it was nothing personal, I think. Uh, they tried to play with the budget to find a spot for me. Uh, they were unsuccessful. Uh, the leader of the, the women's division uh, was Anna Oliveira, who's now the executive director of New York Women's Foundation, and she tried. She tried to find a slot for me. I was the, only, the first trans employee, the only trans employee. I can remember it there. We used to have um, staff meetings. And in those days, so this is the, the week that protease inhibitors were invented. This is the time where gay people started to stop dying. It happened overnight where you would see clients so horribly sick, and then they stopped, and they would start gaining weight, and they would keep coming back to all their support, and they started to stop dying. We had 120 people on staff, and everyone was included, and here I was, the receptionist in the volunteer department, the administrative assistant in the advocacy department. And we were talking about, we're gonna, we're gonna go take GMA, gay men's health crisis, we're going to call it GMHC, move in a new direction. Now that people are starting to stop dying, we're not going to be worried about the 10,000 New Yorkers that have HIV AIDS. We're going to focus on the 7 million that don't. We're going to be about prevention. And everyone was sort of shocked. And they have a whole new set of rules and guidelines. And I'm listening, and I'm listening, and so finally I put up my hand. 120 people, board of directors, management. How does this new ruling and guideline affect transgender people? Silence. Senior management looks to one another. Executive director goes, I don't know, Melissa. We'll get back to you. I sat down stunned. And I discovered if I don't speak up, if I don't speak up now, then who will? And it was, people came up to me, you know, the, the, the part of the staff that was woke, that knew that something had happened that was different. You know, it was not the only time, you know, all communities represented themselves, you know. As you can imagine, GMHC in the 90s was an amazing place with amazing people. So I wasn't the only person, but I was the only person there to speak on this part of LGBT people, and I did, and it was cool. Um, 
after I was let go. We were the, um, the TB project. The cost of fighting tuberculosis in Chelsea was so wildly expensive. They said uh, TB is, is not about lifestyle and economics. It's about um, um, HIV AIDS. Turns out they were wrong. It, it, it was so much about class and the cost of fighting tuberculosis in Chelsea was so wildly expensive. Uh, they eliminated the project and they uh, eliminated my job. All the others found other slots I did not. I went back to the credit union and eventually I went from part-time to full-time and I went to being a manager and I ended up a director and I stayed there for 19 years. about this. Maybe you can talk a little, continue to talk about how you became an activist and um, got involved in politics. I know you were with Empire Pride and um, the Transgender uh, legal, legal Defense and Education Fund. Like, how did, how did you move from being private Melissa to public activist when, Melissa? When I was at the Gender Identity Project in the 90s, um, after I did get clean and sober, finally, uh, and started to claim my space, to claim my seat, to embrace my Melissa-ness, the people in charge said, wow, you know, you bring something special to the table. We don't know you that well, but we have support groups. You should run a support group. And so I did. I was almost mediocre at running a support group. Um, I was not a good social worker. But they discovered that I had a voice uh, and that now that I wasn't uh, drinking myself to sleep every night, I was able to put uh, cognitive thoughts together. And I can tell you that in the late 1990s, when, um, the West Village was going through this intense gentrification and the, get, the meat market was, in fact, a meat market. Uh, during the early morning and the uh, early, up through the early afternoon, it was 125 years of ships coming on the west side of Manhattan using what was an industrial railroad and then having meat packing plants. And they were done by 3 o'clock in the afternoon till 3 in the morning. And so it was completely deserted. And once the sun set, it was the, uh, the stroll for transgender sex workers. And, you know, to the neighborhood, they were transgender sex workers. To us, they were our clients and our friends. Um, and I, I was assigned to do outreach. And in fact, I was, uh, there was a, another bar where I, did, I was a cocktail waitress near there. And on those, you know, cold, two o'clock in the morning on a Monday night, which is dead, you know, and it's 26 degrees outside. The girls would come in, they would buy a Coca-Cola and they could sit for an hour. And, and I got to know them and, and to see them come in and uh, they'd walk in the door and they would be street sex workers and they would sit down and be safe. And all of a sudden, oh my God, this is a 19 year old. And to see them as young people feeling safe. And so I got to know the community. I got, now that I was sober. And of course, you know, I interacted. It was my job. I, I worked the tables. Um, what happened as the gentrification happened, the, the beatniks and bohemians and, and eccentrics that lived in this part of town all of a sudden realized the, these crappy little apartments were worth 20, 30 times the value of what they paid for them. The apartments that they bought for 10,000 were now worth 600,000. And they said, this is great. Get rid of the hookers. And the voices got louder. And finally, they had a town hall. What are we going to do about the, the tranny hookers? And there, it, it started out as being anti-sex worker, and then it morphed into being anti-transgender. And so, it was suggested that I go and speak 
at the town hall on behalf of our community as I knew the white educated part, but I also had experience with the sex worker part. And I went there and I read them the filth. And they got even with me. They put me on the community board. And um, I got to meet the people in charge in those days the elected officials of that part of town where I live were all gay and lesbian. Deborah Glick, Tom Dwayne, then later Christine Quinn, then later Corey Johnson. Tom Dwayne, you know, was a great mentor. You know, rather than, than clutching his pearls like the residents did, he went, you, come here, I want to talk to you. And, um, and he became a great mentor and we became friends. And Chris Quinn became friends, you know. And oh my God, the gays are in charge here. And they created room at their table for me. Emily Giske, Rachel Levine, you know, there's a whole group of Tom and Chris and their allies, village independent Democrats, gay and lesbian independent Democrats. And they created a seat at the table. Gay and lesbian independent Democrats had a big annual gala every year and, and the Chelsea district leader invited me and they had me stand up and give me a shout out. I, you've never had trans people doing mainstream politics before. And so I started doing that and, you know, I found once I had a seat, I found my voice. I, I was good at listening, and I got to learn how a neighborhood works, how a community works. I learned the different voices, the different faces. Finally, a group of trans people created their own transgender political group called the uh, uh, New York F uh, Association for Gender Rights Advocacy Niagara. Um, We've discovered since then, in retrospect, that when you have a group of people that are so diminished and broken by a, an outlaw experience, it's really hard to get in a room together and come up with, with policies that work and affect everyone equally. And um, it was really chaotic, you know, but, but it, it got me access to a larger political system. And I was involved in Niagara. I made more friends. We started to, the Gay Civil Rights Bill had passed in 1986 in New York City. There was no language that protected transgender people, gender identity, gender expression. We said, well, that's bullshit. So we should do it, and so we did. And we, we created a coalition, and we made friends, and, and once there was term limits in the New York City Council, um, there was a whole new generation. We now see it every eight, 10, 12 years. There's a new generation of community activists that come and join City Council, which is how Corey jo Christine Quinn became the speaker, now Corey Johnson, because of term limits. And so we had, instead of all the, the old people that were, had been in the City Council for 10, 15 years in the 70s and 80s, and by the 90s, they were all replaced by young people, people of color, by people from all over the city. We started to see gay people getting elected. I mean, at one point, you had Margarita Lopez and Christine Quinn and then um, Rosie Mendez and, and, and then Carlos and Richie and Jimmy. And, and so it created an opportunity. And so our message, we had eager listeners Bill Perkins, you know, and Phil Reed, the late Phil Reed, a gay guy from Eastville, uh, Melissa Mark Viverito took his place, and they were great. I can remember, so we had our presentation, we had this whole complicated, so half of our people were professors, the other part were, were social workers, so just think of a political group, professors and social workers, oh my God, you know, me, I was a cocktail waitress. So, we had this whole day-long presentation, and, and, and rather than try to speak to the gay and lesbian community, the, the most obvious example, who recognizes 
prohibition for looking different is the Black and Latino Caucus. And those became our natural allies. And we went there with our two-hour presentation. Ten minutes, they stop us. What do you want? Oh, we have a bill. Oh, okay. Who's in favor of the bill? We are. Next. Thank you. And it's like, but, but, and it was done. And what had happened is the political environment had changed, and we were the last to know. We were so out of the loop when it came to politics in New York City, we had not recognized something dramatic had happened. Um, and from that point, we went to uh, Mayor Giuliani, and, we, and the city council said, this is a great idea. And he said, I don't think so. And then uh, Bloomberg took over, and after the dust settled of 9-11, we went through to city council. We went to general welfare, some uh, new guy, some tall, skinny guy named, what was his name? Oh, yeah, de Blasio was in charge. Um, another 10-minute hearing, all in favor. They bring it to the city council, Gifford Miller, all in favor. They bring it to Bloomberg. The, the, they had a great debate a tear-inducing debate on how important transgender people are, that transgender people have been part of New York since the 19th century, and we need our bill if we can protect gay and lesbian, we can protect. And it flew right through, and it gets to Bloomberg, you know, and, and he signed it. I, I, in all of our pictures with him, I don't think he had a smile on his face once. Bloomberg's thing is we want the best people to have access to resources, period. None of this stuff really, you know, he's Bloomberg. It, it's, he's a billionaire, and he just wants people to have access to the workplace. And the, this whole process took, in 2001, two weeks, and it was amazing. And we were just dumbstruck. That, and so we all have the pictures of all of us with the city council, the huge smiles, with the mayor, all of us with, with huge idiot grins and him looking like Mike Bloomberg. And, and we said, this is great. Now let's take it to New York. That was 2001. We're still trying to pass that bill in 2018. And uh, I have, I was in the room when the gay rights bill passed in the legislature. I had been, in those days, the enemy was the Empire State Pride agenda. They told us, no, we've invested too much time, effort, and money in our gay rights bill. There's no room for transgender people. You know, go back and do all the local stuff. And um, that's how we ended up doing New York City. They were as shocked as we were that it passed so quickly and easily. Um, it was a message to them that gay and lesbian no longer is going to work in New York. And we, we lobbied them. When the gay rights bill came in front of the, they had made a deal. They made a deal with Pataki, the Republicans, and the Republicans that ran the Senate that this was going to happen. The Empire State Pride agenda had to pay the Republicans in the Senate. They had to support their candidates. And nothing in Albany is for free. Nothing. And so the gays and lesbians were willing to do it, and the gay rights bill passed. And there was a picture of me in the New York Times. Everyone's giving them a standing ovation, and, and I'm sitting there on the railing, just staring down at everyone celebrating and all the hoopla and, um, on the front page. And, um, and uh, a few, the Democratic minority in the Senate made an effort to amend the language to include gender expression, gender identity. The leaders were David Patterson, Eric Schneiderman, Tom Twain, you know, desperately trying to amend the language. The Republicans literally ignoring them, literally turning their backs to them. The deal was in. It had nothing to do with gender identity. It was going to be gay rights. Uh, they were heroic. The uh, Marty Connor was the minority leader in those days, and they tried. They knew it would fail. They knew it wouldn't work. But they, here was an example of, of the minority in Albany doing something that's right. This was 2001, 2018. That bill is still not passed. You know, we, we went back as all the celebrating. It's like, God, what are we going to do? Gays and lesbians and civil rights in New York. And Charles King, executive director of Housing Works, goes, We'll create our own bill. And I go, well, we, we can't go to the language. Sure we can. 
He goes, what are we going to call it? Well, there's a Sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act. So we've, we can call our agenda, Gender Identity Non-Discrimination non Act. And he goes, yeah, it's good. Gin, people like gin. And I'm thinking, well, I'm sober. And so, well, how about gender? Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act. He goes, sure, that works. So we called it gender. There were four of us in the room, and I got to be the one to call it gender. Um, it still hasn't passed. Trans people, their friends and allies, have done everything short of kidnapping elected officials. We have <laughs> every campaign. In 2015, uh, the governor said, you know what, here's what we're going to do instead. Um, we're going to, I'm in charge of the New York judicial system, and I am going to say that the um, civil rights ordinance of sex includes gender identity, gender expression. I will bring it to the court. I will be the, um, the plaintiff and demand that they change the law to include it under the rubric of sex. So what he was going to do is take what the, the legislative, the statutory bill would be, eliminate the legislature and do it uh, as an executive action, not an executive order, an executive action. He would be the plaintiff in the court system. Uh, and what it does is it gives the, the people that disagree with him 90 days to come forward and fight him in court. No one did, and it's now the law in New York State. Of course, it doesn't have that great statutory celebration of going through the legislature, the great heroic debates. I, you know, I am grateful to Governor Cuomo for doing this. You know, is it how I wanted it to be done? No. The reality is it is what it is. Um, in life, sometimes you don't get what you need. Uh, sometimes you don't even get what you want. Sometimes you get what you get. And in this case, this is what we get. How will gender pass in New York State? Simple, is elect enough progressive Democrats in the New York State Senate that believe in this ideal and then have a governor willing to sign the bill. What, we did, what I ended up doing is building coalition. What I end up doing is strengthening relationships. I have traveled the state. I have worked with schools and business and friends and family and all over the country trying to make a winning coalition. And it got to a point where the Empire State Pride agenda, knowing that after gay marriage passed in New York that they still had to do something that this thing that they didn't think would matter now was sort of a, a pencil in their neck. And the only way to remove it is to have trans people involved in the process. And they had uh, two gals, and then they both left the board, and then I ended up in the board, and then I ended up the board co-chair. Brilliant idea, six years too late. And so trying to bring gay rights to New York in the aftermath of marriage equality passing was difficult, was complicated, and we could not raise enough money to support the Empire State Pride agenda. I certainly couldn't. People loved the work that we did, um, and they said, well, wait a minute, we passed marriage. Why are you still doing this work? And to have all these well-to-do white gay men and women trying to be the avatars of transgender civil rights in New York didn't work. And alas, having me and my friends and allies wasn't enough either. And um, we did the best we could. Um, I'm grateful for what the governor did. Um, for me, my work on at this level of trans rights was done. And I've moved on to different opportunities. You know, um, my background, my vibe is I've now had access to mainstream politics. I've been part of the New York delegation in the last four Democratic conventions, first trans delegate from New York, first trans person to be a member of the Electoral College. Uh, and then two years ago, uh, they, I got hired at the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. So I left the credit union. I was a really good debt collector. Um, 
but a chance to work for community and actually get paid for it was pretty cool. So my friend hired me to be the director of development. We discovered that neither of us had any idea what this job meant. And, um, and so we had to learn, both learn on the job, and it was difficult. I did better than anyone had ever done before. Uh, I look back now and, and see all the missed opportunities. Not, you know, where I just didn't know the, the playing field. And I had some great, great teachers trying to teach me on the job training on how to raise money for a transgender run nonprofit. And um, we did good. And, um, but you know, my role has always been an advocate and an activist. And, you know, my joke about it, between an advocate and, a, and an activist is an advocate gets paid. Um, and, but I was fine. You know, I was a Democratic Party activist and I was a, a LGBT activist. And I can remember the year in New York where marriage equality leapfrogged over transgender civil rights. And I went to the gay pride parade and I was so angry yelling, screaming, spitting at my friends, and they all like turned around and looked at me, and it's like, why are you so angry? And it's like, that's a relevant question. And so I went left and went to the movies, and I said, you know what, you're right. I, you know, for me to spill my years of rage all over you when this is an amazing moment for you uh, is uncalled for. So I went to the movies, and it was dark and cool and, um, and I calmed down, you know, and now, to me, you know, you know, the journey is obvious. It, it's really, it, it's all about race and class. You know, white people have so many different options, so many options and access to resources and people of color don't, LGBT, trans or not. You know, the, the battles, and as we move away toward, from white hegemony, white people get more and more frightened. The more access and opportunity they have, the more frightened they get. The less and less crime is out there, the more frightened they become. And it's perplexing. You know, we, we are 10% of the murders that we saw when I was living in New York City in the early 90s. And, um, and so now I have a new opportunity. And um, I have an opportunity to take my 20 years of experience, of political, of community, of neighborhood experience, and put it to work. And to move from being an activist to being a representative, an elected official in Albany to represent my neighborhood and community. And it's really, it's, it's, it's about my yearning to do service. Um, no one ever becomes an assemblyman for the glory. You know, it goes back to me being that frightened secretary, the receptionist at gay men's health crisis. How will this ruling affect my people to stand up with all those people, one out of 120? How are we going to be affected by this? and the courage of being in the room and, and standing and asking the question. And then working towards finding an answer that saves and protects us all. You know, it lit a spark in me. You know, the desire to do service is important. You know, this campaign now is moving along and it, it's daunting. I'm nervous about being open and, and being, you know, emotionally naked and not just among people that care about me and admire me, but people that don't. Oh my God, this is not what I signed up for. And I can remember in my early trans female steps, and so all I want to do is meet a man and get married. And they said, girl, you have no idea what you're talking about. This is not about gender identity. It's about civil rights. It's about the rights of man and women and everyone else. And if you can find a voice, you know, then it's your job to do what you can. And I said, you people are crazy. And yet all these years later, here I am doing exactly that. And so, you know, Denise Norris and Ricky Ann Wilchins, and, you know, Kathy Otterson, you know, the people at Gender Identity Project, 
Chelsea Godwin, Rusty Moore, you know, and then all those people that did exactly that, that came there as gender confused people and then became amazing trans women and trans men and then became women and men and disappeared to live their lives uh, as men and women, you know. You don't have to be out and loud and proud. Um, you can go and be that person you dreamed of as a five-year-old, as an eight-year-old, you know. The, the head of the Gender Identity Project, uh, a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, woman named Roz Blumenstein, you always used to say, I'm, I'm not trans anything, you know, I mean, I'm a woman, and she changed that. She's, I'm a woman of transgender experience, and, um, and that was is very meaningful because she's a woman first. And maybe her childhood was different. And that model resonates today when we take a look at, at the different manifestations of trans identity. And now that's eliminating because we're right back to where I was when I was eight, you know, man, woman, male, female, and those all those barriers are disappearing. And am I an expert at gender nonconforming and non-binary? No. You know, I didn't know any of those things when I was eight. I don't know them now. You know, my gender identity and gender expression are clear. You know, I am me. I get to be me. I've made it work. By believing in me, I've allowed other people to believe in me. You know, my family is, has been supportive. You know, they've, they're supportive. Um, you know, my family is fractured. And I have, you know, I see my brother very, very, very rarely. I see my mom and sister once a year in California. You know, dad's gone. Don't really see my nephew, you know. Family's complicated. Um, you know, maybe when I solve the problems of everything else in the universe, I can figure out how to make family work. I'm not there yet. Um, but you know, I've made, I found my own family. I found my family, people around me that believe in me, that care about me, that make me feel safe in my environment. So safe in my environment that I am entering this amazing journey uh, to serve not just people like me, but people that are not like me and to have them believe in my vision and my energy and my experience. Thank you. I want to ask you one more question. Um, I saw, and, and, I know, and you let me know this, that you are in the film uh, that I guess came out of the White House when uh, President Obama announced um, that the Stonewall Inn and the park in front of it would be a national monument. Can you tell me how did, how did you how was that um, an experience that you had, and what was that like for you? Um, so what had happened is, under, under President Obama, there was a desire to expand the National Park Service and make sure that all, all parts of American culture are included. And it's like, we should do something for uh, gay people, gay lesbian people, gay the, you know, the whole LGBTQ. And so Stonewall seemed to be as good a place to start as any. And, and so the, uh, the National Park Conservatory Project, they do this. They, they, they take concepts and they turn them into part of the national park system whether it's the, the women's movement in New York, whether it's the whaling industry in Bedford, Massachusetts, generally it takes three, five, 10, 15 years to get all the pieces in order, to have funding and all this, and figure, well, let's start with a LGBT district. Let's start centered around Stonewall, but include Lower Manhattan. And they reached out and they got my name, and so I became part of the steering group. And so I would go to the meetings, the walking tours. We, we did a gay and lesbian walking tour of, LGBT walking tour of Greenwich Village, 100 years that ended with Stonewall. We talked about gay and lesbian New York in the 1880s and the 1910. And for all of us to see all this extraordinary history of what Bleecker Street was and the idea that 
window shopping was a way for gay men to find one another because if they were caught loitering on the street by the police, they would all get beaten. And so they would pretend to be shopping, and that's how gay men got to meet. And to hear all the, and to see this whole part of Bleecker Street, that's now NYU, but was in fact one of the most notorious red light districts at the turn of the 20th century, that was dominated by hangouts for gays and lesbians. Astonishing. And, um, and where Eleanor Roosevelt lived near her, near the largest lesbian bar in New York City. Astonishing. And to the shock of the Conservancy and the Obama administration and the community, this idea came to fruition immediately. Jerry Nadler was the lead on it. He had great authority uh, in New York City and within the federal government under President Obama. And it just happened. And of course, well, they wanted a Stonewall veteran. They knew that. And they wanted the documentary to be diverse. And they came to me. And I said, well, this is great. If you don't have people of color in this video, it, it will never. And so we were able to, to make sure that diverse voices were heard. And they, I, Octavia Lewis was included, and I was included. And it was quick and easy and simple. And it starts out with a Stonewall veteran. And it starts out there was someone else, I forget, and me and Octavia. And then the rest was President Obama. And I saw the video, and it, it was, um, oh, and Eunuch, Eunuch Ortiz. So, it was, it was, so here's Eunuch, so she's a, les a Latina lesbian, and, um, and me, and then Octavia is African-American trans woman, and then a Stone Tommy was a Stonewall veteran. So it's good representation, right? And, um, and it was just awesome. And uh, you know, I'm privileged to be part of it. And you know, my time involvement as a representative of trans community is over. The, the culture has moved on. And now at, at, at TILT, at Transgender Legal Defense Education Fund, when it comes time for trans representation, there's a, a gender non-conforming, non-binary person of Filipino birth. And this person who goes by they and them is now, when called upon to explain community, they get this option rather than someone with a fixed gender identity like me. So again, the culture moves on. And, you know, Sometimes you get what you get, you know, and, and this is what's happening. And the more the boundaries fall apart, the more people come out of the woodwork to claim a seat at that particular table. And me, I get to try other things, such as be here with you today. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to tell me that uh, before we say goodbye? One of the uh, the memes that we've seen in an effort of, from different uh, LGBT organizations was this idea that it gets better. And what I've discovered that um, it gets better is, is not universal. And I think it's, it's really, really hard in America uh, for people of color and for poor people uh, to guarantee access to resources. Um, I think that, um, that people have to be aware of experiences that are not their own, that the first stage of liberation is for yourself. And then once that's achieved, it's really, really important to um, extend a hand to others who have different experiences. And I've learned this, and I'm hoping everyone learns it, um, that all of us should be free. You know, it's not enough for a couple of us to be free. We all have to be free. Uh, here in America, we're facing a very, very difficult, difficult time with um, actions out of Washington, D.C., that for the first time in many, many years that the, the federal government has decided that, um, that we're, we are not worthy of being protected. And so it's really, really important that we coalesce and come together and protect one another and, and not make assumptions as to you know, who, who is winning and who is not. And, uh, I, I want to be able to still do my part, you know, but um, I'm thrilled at the time I spent, you know, getting my seat at the table, getting my hand up in the room, and now I'm mentoring the next generation. And uh, I follow their lead, and I hope it turns out good for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Can we just get uh, just like 50 seconds of room tone real quick? Just the silence in the room. Silence in the room. I saw that moment.